Hello and welcome to this latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions and today I am grateful, honestly grateful because we did have a bit of a gap and Alan stepped in to save my veggie bacon <laughs> and talk to us again about copyright which has come up recently in the news and been very relevant to me especially in connection with esports and most recently in the news around coding with a very interesting sort of judgment made in the US. Um, but really, social media as well, because in our last virtual bridge session, if you take a look, was talking about the use of TikTok. And when I tried to record the session and then put it onto YouTube, I ran into so many problems. And Alan was obviously there to save me. So <laughs> continuing on with a good theme, Alan, save my bacon one more time. I'll try my best, Kenji. I'll try my best. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all. I think I've met most of you. I'm not quite sure about Derek. Did I hear an SQA moniker there? I'm afraid so. Sorry. That's all right. No, not at all. Uh, I don't think we've met Derek, but it's nice to hear that you're on the call. No problem. Now, if um, Kenji would let me screen share. Um, are we still okay? Because I can only see Jason. Is everybody yes. else okay? Good. Yep. Right. Thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Kenji, to um, talk again on my very, very favourite topic. And today it's social media, esports and copyright, just adding to the um, adding to the mix of copyright. Can, are you going to have to control this, Jason, aren't you? Yes, and then you yes. give it the traditional next slide. <laughs> well, <laughs> in best Boris Johnson style, next slide, please. I can't get over the fact that they haven't got in that wonderful uh, facility, the fact that they haven't got a clicker. Uh, anyway, moving on quickly. This is going to deteriorate even further. Um, yes, copyright. I, I'm very much old school and I can remember the days when we had libraries. Um, that one's horribly out of focus, but intentionally. And at the time, if you picked up a resource or content, it said, all rights reserved, we're all familiar with this. And that was pretty much the terms and conditions that you got for that particular um, form of content. Now, however, I would um, suggest a bit lightheartedly, perhaps, that YouTube and its ilk are now the new library. I could have the next slide, please, Jason. And we've moved on very quickly within colleges. Now, obviously, I put my hand up. I'm not a practitioner as such. I, I, it's a long time since I've been in a college. I have been delivering lectures to staff and students up until a year ago, and I'm still available to do that once this all closes down. Um, and I've discovered that libraries, sadly, in, in, in lots of cases, are um, they're diminishing both in size and with the number of books that they've got because we've moved into a digital uh, a digital world. Now, old school was that all rights reserved, the new school, and this is a tiny part of terms and conditions from a social platform. And this was what uh, prompted uh, Kenji to ask me to do this this week, but there, there have been other cases of this recently. I've had a number of uh, calls from uh, colleges recently on this matter, that if you use social media, be incredibly careful about their license. Nobody reads it. It's only uh, people like myself, perhaps Jason has, has dabbled in the dark arts of social media licensing. But the two highlighted aspects there, we don't claim ownership of your content, but you grant us a license to use it. And the next bit down, this is the important bit, you hereby grant us a non-exclusive, royalty-free, transferable, sub-licensable, worldwide license, sorry about the American spelling, to host, use, distribute, modify, run, copy, publicly perform, or display, translate, and create derivative works of your content. In other words, they can pretty much do what they like with it. You still retain the copyright, so you can still monetize it, commercialize it, whatever you want to call it, but you've let the genie out the bottle. Can you move on, please, Jason? Thank you. So these are the major players uh, recognized by their icons, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube and Twitter. Can we, next one please? And the content that we're talking about is the content that people are very keen to move around these days, not just within social media, but we'll 
concentrate on that this morning, but also websites and uh, within VLEs and so on. So we're talking about text, we're talking about video images. Yeah, go on. Thanks, uh, Jason. Um, so images, now <laughs> I'm sure we all get from well-meaning friends throughout the day, texts, emails, uh, social media platform messages and so on. Oh, look at this morning's Daily Telegraph cartoon by Matt. And I don't know whether they think I'm the only person they're sending it to. It might be, it's, un it's unlikely, uh, particularly when they're doing it through MailChimp and you discover that it's gone out to all their mailing list. And I, I've challenged a few of them on. I'm quite happy to look at the Matt cartoon and laugh at it because they're always very funny. But I ask them in my nerdy, geeky way, do you realize that you're infringing copyright? Oh, no, I'm not infringing copyright. Well, you are in actual fact. Did you ask Matt or the Daily Telegraph or his agent or his syndicate uh, to, for permission to circulate that? No, of course, you don't need to do that. It's on the internet, so it's absolutely fine. Shut up and go back into your nerdy hole, Alan. Um, now, obviously, that happens, happens all the time, and there is very little done about it until it starts to get interesting for the content creator. So with images, we're talking about photographs, cartoons, designs, logos, and paintings, all covered by the designs, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988, which is our Bible. Can you move on, please, Jason? Uh, now, I'm going back to license. The theme of a lot of this this, this morning uh, is, is licensing. And that, again, there's your YouTube license. Now, that's the license that you, as a user, give to YouTube. You grant that worldwide, non-exclusive, blah de blah de blah license. Can we move on, please, Jason? Next one. Now, this basically comes down to the fact that you're owing your soul at the company store. And if you're old enough, you may remember that song or your parents used to play it to you back in the long time ago. I remember it well. Think about what you're giving them worldwide. It's not just UK. It's non-exclusive. So anybody can use this. It's royalty free. So it's highly unlikely you're going to get any money, money back from this. It's a transferable license. And if I'm somebody using YouTube, I can sub-license it onto somebody else. Next uh, slide, please. So it's all about the license. And Personally, sadly, in some respects, I think this is the way the world is going to go. I'll, I'll come to that in the next few slides. Thanks, uh, Jason. So YouTube's license to other users. So this is them. They've got their license from me. I've permitted them. And they're saying that I also grant each other user of the service my content to distribute, reproduce, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry to keep reinforcing this, but that's what we need to get the message across because people are really getting caught out about by this badly these days, not necessarily so much in education, but in the commercial world. And we serve the commercial world as well. Thanks, Jason. Okay, reinforcement. And I've put in an extra one at the bottom here. Uh, blah, -de blah, -de blah, -de blah, user content, in unconditional, irrevocable, now known or here and after invented. So you're signing your life away for I don't know, artificial intelligence, co uh, copyright robots, whatever else somebody can, can think about. Just please think about what it is that you're doing. And for those that you work with, this message has to go out because if you get caught, the issues can be considerable. And, and some of you are sitting there perhaps in agencies that have already been caught, but we'll not go into that just at the moment. Next one, please, Jason. So what's the solution? If you're trying to use other people's content in social media or on the web or for your VLE, 16 tons. Thanks, Gage. <laughs> Who's it, Johnny? I can't, I, I haven't, I can't see. I'll get that later. Right. It's the solution. Ask for permission or a license to use somebody else's content. I know this is boring and you don't have to do it all the time, but you do if you feel there is a risk in what you're going to do. It also helps if you appreciate that there is a risk in what you're going to do. Not enough people understand the risk. You can create your own content or you can use content that you know for definite is either copyright free, Creative Commons licensed, or it's in the public domain. And that doesn't mean the internet. Can I have the next slide, please? 
just briefly, there's a slight digression because the public domain is, is incredibly annoying. The true definition of it is it's 70 years after the death of the, author, of the creator. And this year, 2021, one of the more significant um, works that came into the public domain and is already being used and used and used was uh, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And already people are making new films of it. And I'm sure we'll see a range of merchandise and various other things coming out because they won't have to pay a penny because that went into the public domain 70 years after Fitzgerald's death. The other way is you can purposely declare your work to be in the public domain using the Creative Commons public domain license. And a lot of people use that. This is effectively what the likes of Pixabay and Unsplash the image galleries are using because you don't have to give an acknowledgement. They prefer it if you can, but it's not essential. And it, other things or stuff that isn't ever copyright is in the public domain, ideas, facts, government publications, but always exercise caution. Uh, ideas, ideas aren't, in, aren't copyright because copyright, as we all know, only exists when that idea becomes fixed. Facts is an interesting one because that's helped out a lot of people when they come to copy. Uh, you've got to be careful though, because if you're copying facts, you're also maybe copying the publisher's layout and the publisher has a, has a copyright in the way in which they lay out their books. Next one, please. Now, music. And that was the reason that Kenji contacted me this week was that instance where People are using TikTok, creating TikTok videos, and then making them, sorry, uploading them onto another platform, in this case, YouTube. Now, what I've done is a little bit of research here, and you, th this will be available on the recording, and I'm more than happy to, uh, to send the presentation out to everybody, as I probably should have done in advance. Uh, I've just put up here some suggestions. We're not going to go into them at all, but some suggestions where you can buy music for social media. You can buy it or you can get it for free. I think too often people are quite happy just to take a sound file and think, oh, that'll do fine. I'll just stick Tina Turner, um, uh, the best, what is it? You know the one I mean. Um, they, they stick that on their commercial video and think, no, that'll, that'll be fine. And then wonder why they get a takedown notice. Those, that's a very few of the websites that are available there, licked uh, iMovie clips quick and so on available. Uh, the quick goes with GoPro, by the way. It's, it fascinated me to find out that GoPro manufacturers of cameras also provide um, copyright music that you can use when you're making a GoPro video. Exactly the same as TikTok allow you to use what they call elements to make your TikTok video. The problem is that the license that they've got doesn't transfer into the next platform that you want to put it. So in Kenji's case, when it was putting it onto YouTube and the TikTok music was perfectly licensable and perfectly valid on the TikTok video, it's not on YouTube. It might be, it might be fortunate that there is a license sitting on YouTube for it, but you're never sure, unfortunately. We're told that it's going to get better in the next few months that, um, that um, the platforms are going to license much more, uh, much more music so that uh, we'll know in advance and we should be able to test out if, it, if the YouTube thing goes well, if um, we can test it out in advance before we actually commit to loading it and then suffering a, a strike or a takedown. One, just a couple in there that I find of particular interest, Epidemic Sound, I've just come across it this week, just when I was doing the research for this, um, Magisto is extremely helpful and useful uh, and, and quite a disruptor as well. You'd need to look at it to, to, to see. But the one that I've always uh, referred people to is Moby Gratis. And Moby is a, a chill out artist, been on the go for donkey's years, sold millions and millions of songs. And he has his own website. You go to that one. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? Because um, Moby, for example, is quite happy for people to use, particularly student projects, independent filmmakers and non-profits, they can use his music that he's got listed. I think there's something like 200 tracks on his website that you can use um, just for an acknowledgement. 
there you go, Kenji's put the, the uh, link up. So some of the terms that you need to know when you come to images, music, various other things. Royalty free doesn't mean royalty free. Well, it does in a way, but not the way people think it does. It means usually you have to pay a one-off fee. If, for example, you go to Shutterstock, iStock, Getty, or any number of the other ones that uh, Dreams Time, they're, they're, they do it as well. Um, you see your image that you want to use in your website, your, your uh, materials, whatever it is that you're doing, and you can pay a one-off fee. Again, depending upon the license, you might be able to use it multiple times. You might be able to use it within a particular time frame, but there is still a one-off fee. It's not usually that expensive. It's worth looking into. If it's rights managed, that's expensive because you pay once and then pay for each use, but you're getting more exclusive photos. You're not getting images that are on every single image gallery. Creative Commons, if you... I'm sure many of you that are listening uh, and watching this are familiar with Creative Commons, but if you're not, please, please look it up and go to it. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned them there, the CC Mixter and Gemendo, I think they're on a list, maybe still to come up. Uh, Gemendo, I'm not sure about. It seems to be both CC and commercial, uh, but others that Creative Commons will point you to will allow you to use music. Now, obviously, it's not the top the top 40. It's not the hit parade, he said, used, showing his age. It's, it's music which is similar. It's production music as opposed to commercial music. And as somebody who used to run an audiovisual department and uh, made a lot of training videos for commercial clients, I remember one of the first ones. It was simply the best they wanted. Thanks for the prompt, Kenji. And uh, I said to them, yes, you're having a laugh. You have, your budget doesn't cover that. I think we had about a £5,000 budget to make the entire half hour video. It was one of the worst I ever made, I have to say. Anyway, let's have simply the best play all the way through it, they said. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, I did, for the sake of um, a laugh, just get in touch with the publisher and discovered that it, it was way in the region of £500,000 for the original uh, and in actual fact, Tina Turner doesn't allow the original to be used. It's a very good um, sound alike. Uh, so we went to production music and that cost us a couple of hundred pounds and the client never really noticed the difference. Next one, please. <clears throat> right, the other thing that you can use, and I'm sorry, this, some of the slides, the, the, this has been put together in a bit of haste this week. I've not edited them all that well and there are too many words on them, but something else that we've got to bear in mind You've got your royalty free, you've got your creative commons. We do have, particularly within education, we've got a lot of copyright exceptions that we can use. Now, I've said at the bottom line there, it's a subject for another day. If you want to know more, please do contact me. This is a particular project that I'm very keen to get into the colleges. I was disappointed to find out previously, pre-COVID, when I was going around colleges, that many, many copyright users didn't even know about the original exceptions that we got in 1988, uh, and that some of which were updated and upgraded in um, 2014. Craig, is it? Yeah, 2014. Um, and they're there. They're absolutely wonderful. It, there is a move, I'm seeing it within higher education, to encourage the use of exceptions. Got to be careful. It's the one big proviso is non-commercial and commercial, non-commercial in education. That's a divisive argument as well. Um, but please give some consideration to the copyright exceptions. I've got handouts and so on on it. If you're interested, you'll get my email address at the end. I'm more than happy to pass them on to you. Next one, please, Kenji. Uh, right. I'll start off by saying at the bottom there, this is the only copyright free image I could find of Jennifer Lopez, courtesy of Pixabay. It's obviously somebody doing a doodle of somebody that looks like Jennifer Lopez. Every other image, I didn't look through every single one, obviously, but every other image was licensed. Now, the reason I've put this little case study up here is that she was sued for this 150,000 by the photographer over an Instagram photo of herself. And this is happening more and more. It's, it's happening everywhere. The celebrities make more of it, but it's happening in general life that people will take pictures of other people without asking their permission, use the image, maybe edit it in some way, maybe put it through a filter, pop it onto social media, 
and it pops up. Now, that whole process means that if I took the picture of Kenji, who is a well-known celebrity, if I took the picture of Kenji without his permission and then posted it on uh, my website, uh, Instagram, anything like that at all, I'm then putting myself into the Instagram license machine and I've got no permission. It's my copyright. And what would, what, where, where this went wrong with Jennifer Lopez was that she took the image. So let's go back to Kenji. Kenji saw the image, really liked it, thought it was an exceptionally good one. It was very flattering. And he stuck it on his Instagram. But he can't do that because I own the copyright in the first place. Now, you may say, well, you told us earlier, Alan, that pretty much anybody can use it. But if you look at the small print, which was there, you can only do this if you have permission or if it is your own content. And that's where everybody keeps getting caught out. So be very careful what you put up. Uh, it's, individually, it's, it's fine. There's not a lot going to happen. Celebrities will pick up on it. But just within education and SQA, Derek, be very, very careful because you've got the problem of potential reputational loss or damage. Finance, you, you, well, finance is bad enough, but it's the reputational damage that, that can happen. I saw that one of the Kardashians this week was most upset because uh, one of her assistants, and of course, all the Kardashians have thousands of assistants, had unwittingly posted an unfiltered, unedited, unmade up picture of one of the Kardashians. I have no idea which one. I don't really care. And she spent most of the week trying to get it down and managed to uh, invoke, you know, this is always, uh, this is always, I've loved this one, the Barbara Streisand effect. I don't know if you've ever come across the Barbara Streisand effect. Look it up. It's, it's a wonderful concept. Barbara Streisand a few years ago took the hump at a photographer who'd taken a picture of her house, Malibu, I think it is, and she caused such a stushy, good Scottish word there, she caused such a stushy that Millions of pictures of her house appeared, whereas she just let it go, there would only have been one or two pictures. But the Barbara Streisand effect, the celebrities all get caught up in it. Right, moving on, I'm starting to gabble again. Uh, this is another issue that causes so many problems. I, I've got uh, first-hand experience of this with a client in Dundee. Uh, a dress designed by a student at your college that's now been next, push, push it again. All of a sudden, millions of the, the, the things. That's the way the fashion industry works these days. And this has happened where somebody put up a nice piece of test work, popped it on public facing uh, website, not in the confines of the VLE. And the next thing they know, a few weeks later, the market is flooded with their design. Very difficult to deal with. Next slide, please, Kenji. So what can you do? And again, apologies for there being a lot here. Very quickly, and it's very good practice, but so many people don't do it. Add a copyright statement, including the symbol, on all your content. Uh, even put an announcement at the start of a podcast, an audio file, whatever it might be. This, this is copyright. It belongs to, and it was recorded on such a date. Now, I know that the clever people can remove it, but you've got the original that has that on it. Uh, reverse search your images regularly to see if they're being copied. Tinai is the, is the software that I use for that. Use low resolution thumbnail images to make them difficult, to, well, more, more difficult to copy. And again, I had a, I had a heartbroken photographer um, as a client oh, a couple of months ago. Virtually all her portfolio had disappeared. And I said, well, how did you get it? Well, put it on my website. And I was like, please don't put your entire portfolio. Only put up what you can afford to lose because somebody will take it someplace and it's so difficult. You don't have the resources to keep chasing them all over the internet. Ask your own social networks to find out if there's any infringement. If you're posting on your own website, please put in your terms and conditions that you have a clause about your intellectual property and the intellectual property of other content that you may be using on your website that you have permission to use. And it, there is a cost. And not everybody gets uh, permission to do the trademark that they choose to go for, but it's worth considering trademark register 
and post it as often as possible. Next slide, please. Now, this, this is something that Kenji and I have been talking about for a little while. I, I don't know if any of you, um, Jason, I think you would probably have been there. Uh, CDN, it was just a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it, Kenji? Did uh, a, an amazingly good day on esports. Now, esports, I'm familiar with my grandchildren, my grandson's playing um, Fortnite and uh, one or two other little bits and pieces that they're. Fortnite's okay, we, we, we're okay with that, but uh, their mum and dad have given them a little bit more leeway in some of the more brutal games. And effectively, what they're doing, because they're playing with friends on the network, and they're involved in a form of eSport, but it has massively scaled up in recent years, so much so that in Dundee here, uh, there is a proposal, it seems pretty valid proposal, that at the, water, at the waterfront, which has been still being developed, there's going to be built a 4,000 seat esports arena where people will come, as in the image there, and they'll sit and instead of watching people play football for live or an indoor sport, they're going to sit and watch them do it on a screen. Next one, please, Kenji. Now, the reason Kenji and I got involved in the discussion about this was the copyright. And I, I think, in, in fairness to him, I'm not misquoting him, I don't think he was fully aware perhaps of what esports meant in the realms of copyright and hadn't found much about it. There is a wealth of information out there and I would refer you in particular, I don't think I've got the link up. Um, there's a very good program at Strathclyde University called Create. And there's a lady on there, she spoke at a conference I ran last year, Amy Thomas, and she's written an exceptionally good paper on esports and copyright. Now, if you're in a college that is doing esports, you may be doing it already, but I would encourage you, and I'm thinking about SQA here. It is Derek, isn't it, I think? Is it Derek, Kenji, thumbs up, that's SQA? Yeah, because um, SQA is an area, Derek, that I've often wanted to talk to. I've made a few approaches in the past, and I'm sorry to go slightly off piste here, um, because I think SQA could help massively with copyright literacy in the country. And when you're now running, not you personally, but when courses are now being run on esports, which are entirely intellectual property, there is no product, nothing physical at all. So it's essential that the people who want to get involved in esports, those who are the developers, the music composers, and again, I'm very fortunate to have a, a reasonably close friend who plays for Simple Minds. And he doesn't make much money out playing for Simple Minds. He makes his money out of writing music for the games industry here in Dundee. So he does extremely well out of that because he makes sure he gets his copyright. So you've got the craft, the graphics and the coding. I'll come back to the coding just in a moment. So eSports, who owns the copyright? The publishers, definitely. And this is where the problem arises because everything gravitates towards the publishers. I don't know the names of them all offhand. The music composers, maybe. The games developers, maybe. Graphic photographers, maybe. Now, there's a lot of chat on the blogs about esports that the players should own the copyright in the way in which... I think there's another uh, panel to come up there, Kenji. That's it. It's all about the licenses. The players... Now, th the analogy here is that some players are claiming that they should be able to copyright the way in which they play the game because apparently the, the really fast ones can do so many clicks per second. It's quite astonishing. And they train for this. Now, this was brought up a number of years ago about football, that the way in which players play set pieces, for those of you who know a little bit about football, uh, it's almost like choreography. And choreography can be copyrighted. So the reasoning, <laughs> the logic was that the way in which a, you know, a team passes the ball to each other the player should be able to copyright as their particular move. Right, leaving that alone. Now the esports players are saying something similar, but they're not getting very far because I can see the argument against it. They apparently can't. But again, this is just a fleeting reference to it today. It's, it's a subject that, that I think needs a lot more development. Next slide, please, Kenji. Kenji mentioned this one at the start as well, the Google versus Oracle. It's been hailed as the copyright case of the century because it went on for 10 years. 
Now, basically, what happened was that Google used code from Sun. Sun was bought up by Oracle, and the coding was effectively the API that helps run Java, which forms, if I've got this right, I've probably gone completely off, off uh, kilter here, but it run, it's, it's very important in the Android operating system that Google use. And Google fully admitted to the fact that they copied it. It was a minuscule amount of coding, but it's a brilliant example of quality on quantity in copyright. You know, if people say, why can't I copy X percent of a book? Well, in some cases you can copy X percent of a book, but if it's only the chapter summaries that you want to copy, that gives you a very good insight into the book and you wouldn't then buy the book. So the same here is it was a minuscule amount of coding, but it is an incredibly essential coding. Uh, and what happened, and we can't really take too much out of this in this country because it was um, judged, one part of the case was judged on fair use in America, uh, which we don't have. We have fair dealing. It's still of interest because this is going to have ramifications, good ramifications, I would think, because it's showing the world that people who are writing computer code should be able to rely on other people's work so that all the things that they're writing the code for will operate properly, the whole purpose of the APIs, so that everything fits in together uh, and is not proprietary. Because as soon as it becomes proprietary, it becomes monopolistic. Uh, and that was an argument that was raised in this case as well. But the BBC put out a very good report on it. If you just go on the BBC website and Google, uh, and Google, Google versus Oracle, you'll, uh, you'll find it. And it gave a good explanation. Probably held us out better than I've just given. Next one. We're just about there. So what's the future? Well, I fancy one of those cars, top left picture there. I, I, I want one of those. Um, I also want to be Dan Dare. Again, that is a historical reference. More up to date slightly is the doctor. And then we've got robots and AI. Next one, please, Kenji. It's all gonna come down to licenses. The world is going to be controlled by licenses. Next one. And we're going to be controlled by micropayments. We're already being controlled by micropayments. If you think about it, particularly during COVID, the number of payments that you have made using a contactless payment system. And we've got our barcodes, we've got our QR codes, we've got add to cart. We're all familiar with this. And the successful companies are the ones who have got a seamless process where you don't have to work too hard at it. And of course, at the top of that, in my estimation, is Amazon. Uh, they've just got it down to an incredibly fine art. Next one. Last one. Thank you so much for forbearance. Uh, thank you so much for putting up with my technical inabilities at the start. That's who I am. That's what I do. Uh, that's my company. My website is a work in progress, but we're just about there. Over the next two weeks, I will have a, a, an all singing, all dancing website. But in the meantime, if you wish to contact me, either email or mobile phone. Thank you so much. I will pass back to you, Kenji. Thank you, Alan. And um, I, I should say Jason was doing most of the slide pushing. There. Oh, I thought you were pushing it because it was only you that I saw on the it was you that I saw on this mic. Sorry. But thank, Sorry, thanks Jason. again for sharing your thoughts. There's a wealth of information in there. But unfortunately, that's all we have time for this part. Um, that's going out on YouTube. So for all of you joining us there, thank you very much. And thank you to Alan here for delivering his thoughts. Um, and until we see you again, stay safe. <laughs>